Really, uh, I'm going to do it a little bit differently. Um, I'm, as she said, I'm Brett Mitchell. I'm with San Juan Unified. We're uh, the ninth largest district in the state. We have 88 schools, roughly 40,000 enrollment, and we have bond authorization of about 1.2 billion, which, as you heard a lot about today, it sounds like a lot of money, but we have about a $2.5 billion capital improvement campaign going on that we've got to figure out how to pay for. So uh, I want to frame the topic in that mindset that, We've heard a lot about uh, doing uh, more with less. And everybody's sort of in the same boat as, as everyone else. You know, we're, we've got a lot to do uh, in our schools. They're deteriorating, they're old. And we're trying to figure out how to fund them, how, we're gonna, how we get workforce interested in our work, that's that kind of stuff. And, and I remember, uh, you have to forgive me for a minute, I'm, a, I'm just an old redneck, I grew up on a ranch, and so I live on folksy wisdom every now and then, right? And so I remember my dad telling me, you know, uh, if you keep doing what you've been doing, you'll keep getting what you've been getting. And so, you know, every year when I'm trying to figure out how we're gonna pay for this, what are we gonna do for es escalation, all these problems were cyclical all the time, facing them. And at some point I, I remembered what my dad said, and that's, you gotta do something different. You gotta figure something else out, be innovative. and. Uh, the other thing he used to tell me, if you don't mind me saying it in a crowd, is, and by the way, if someone gave you a, a bucket of cow droppings to eat, there wouldn't be any sense in nibbling. So, <laughs> you know, jump right in and get her done. And so, uh, so my, my goal of the, of the <laughs> I'll let that sort of settle in for some of you. My goal of, of the topic was really to uh, flip the classroom. You can see this is a school district now, and I'm talking to some folks that I've become very confident in, in terms of solutions, and, and I'm really trying to replicate some fantastic discussions that I've had with industry providers that will hopefully draw out some solutions that we've been talking about that we're implementing in my district that in some cases may be innovative, in some cases, you may think, oh, you know, we're already doing that. But really, the idea is here, if you hear something that piques your interest, call on these folks, call on me, because I think uh, we, we do have to do things a little bit differently, right? So I'm going to uh, allow them uh, an opportunity to introduce. I don't want to spend a bunch of time doing introductions. They're in the manual. They'll speak for themselves. They're very intelligent people. They'll do a quick introduction. But I'm just going to ask some questions that's again intended to um, weave through a few topics of planning, the importance of planning, really. And as districts, how can we build in some efficiencies into what we do? And also, what can we do that's innovative in terms of project delivery, okay? So with that, I'll start with Samer. Samer, thanks for being here. I know you've been sick, and you're here anyway. So my first question for you is, you weren't in Disneyland, were you? <laughs> no, I was not. Okay, good. <laughs> That some of you might get that, but... Uh, <laughs> well, thank you so much, Brett. Um, good evening, everyone. And my name is Samuel Zubedi. I'm the Director of Facilities at Marina Valley Unified School District. And I'm very happy to be here and also sitting next to my nicest, wise, net redneck here on the, <laughs> on the podium. <laughs> so, Samuel, from your perspective, from a school district's perspective, tell us what you think the most challenging element of implementing projects are right now. Well... Among the one million and one challenging things we're going through every day, um, uh, funding appears to be the raising to the top of the list item that always faces us as school district officials and how to get your project funded. Because in facilities, as you guys all know, it is a game, like life is a game. Facilities is no different. And the name of the game is money. So how to get money to fund your projects, build and modernize. This is the most challenging topic for facility uh, officials because the funds, the sources of funds are limited, not that many. And majority of them coming from either local bonds or state bonds. Developer fees in 
poor areas where developers are not paying or not building anything, it's going to be a challenging situation as well. So we, need all to, we all need to be wise in getting the money and how to spend it. The, the second challenging thing, and I will try to end it here, is the scope creep. And that's in basically when you start a design of a $10 million project, and by the time you finish the design and you start bidding it, it becomes a 12 or $15 million project. And that is a very uh, challenging thing. So these two things, if we put them in one perspective, we come up with one conclusion is how to get the money and spend it wisely and monitor that through the steps. Thanks, Emmer. And speaking of scope creep, no kidding. Going to the architect in the crowd. Uh, Brian, just quickly introduce yourself and then also, um, what cha if you were to talk to Sam or if you were his architect, talk about the challenges uh, that you face developing public schools. Well, good evening. I'm Brian Whitmore. I'm the president of BCA Architects and uh, very honored to be here tonight in front of all of you folks that uh, I think are facing similar challenges, especially nationwide. Um, as Samer mentioned, fundamentally there's, there's two ways in which we as uh, uh, public schools receive funding through the state of California. The first of which it was mentioned was the general obligation bond, which is fundamentally based on property value. Um, and property value uh, is certainly on the rise here in California. Um, but we think about California as a state, I think California is a bit of a misnomer because we have uh, tremendous um, uh, upscale uh, affluent uh, sorts of areas like the Bay Area and Los Angeles. And then we have some pretty impoverished areas uh, in the Central Valley and the north part of the state. And so when we look at sort of the, the opportunity for uh, districts to bond, um, oftentimes that district authority um, is, is very little uh, or a lot depending on uh, the affluency of the property values and everything associated. We've also uh, just recently had the uh, Proposition 51 passed in the state of California. This is the uh, first proposition that actually came to us in a little over a decade. Uh, in fact, the longest time in the period of California uh, that we haven't had a state bond. Now, um, just to give you an idea of the size, that state bond is about $9 billion. Um, the local bonds totaled in 2016 somewhere around 25 or $26 billion. So even that state match money is not a huge amount as it relates to um, the funding per capita, but those districts that are eligible, um, either through modernization, the age of their facilities, or through new construction, um, if they have any growth, uh, can access some of that money. But it really is a challenge because they're a very small um, uh, pot of money in, in some cases, and especially as we talk about rural districts or socioeconomically impoverished districts, um, we have a challenge uh, getting the funds uh, back into the classroom, back into the students and the teachers who, who really demand them. And really, if you go all throughout the state, you know, everybody wants to be globally competitive. Everybody wants to create a space um, that is transformative, that is all of the things that we saw in Rex's presentation from last night. Um, but how do we get them there? And the other thing that we face is a lot of those funds are not available day one. You know, we can have a large district, you know, take Brett's district, for example, uh, might pass a $100 million or a $200 million uh, bond, um, one of the things is that those bonds will be sold in series. And so the first bond might be a quarter or a fifth of that total amount. And then two or three years later, they might do another one and another one and another one. And the reason for that is to uh, really hedge their bets against property values. Uh, as the property values um, may decrease over time, they want to find themselves in a position where they're owing money back uh, through that bond mechanism. And so when we talk about scope creep, one of the other things um, that we try to manage as, as a firm is uh, construction escalation. And the tremendous construction escalation not only happening in California, but nationwide. Um, we oftentimes tell our clients, you know, four to five percent per year compounding is an average. Um, that's, that's an average across the state. We have areas in the Bay Area where it's 10, maybe 15 percent per year to the midpoint of construction. Um, and how do we offset that when we only have access to maybe a, f a quarter or, the f or a fifth of that money in that first year. Um, so prioritization, um, phasing, you know, that master planning, those specifications when we, when we first approach a district and do needs assessment is critical uh, because we really have to figure out what's the most compelling spaces that we can build day one and what do we think is maybe the most expensive that also ultimately is going to escalate or scope creep later on um, because we may not have the funds to actually do it. And when 
as, as I'm sure Sam or you know, when you can't complete a project um, because of, of all of these things, scope creep, escalation, what have you, it becomes incredibly hard to go back to the voters a couple of years or four years or six years or eight down, years down the road and ask them to help you pass another bond. All right. So, Marika, you've uh, heard a lot uh, this weekend, uh, today, yesterday, uh, about costs, school districts and the challenges they face, the schedule challenges they face. So do us, uh, just talk a little bit about who you are first and then talk to us about, you have some interesting solutions. And so talk about that a little bit. Sure, I feel like I've met everyone here so far. Um, and a lot of you guys know about Project Frog, but for those who don't, um, we're a prefab green building and technology company. Um, we really started um, at the genesis of Frog about 10 years ago, trying to tackle a lot of the inefficiencies in the construction industry and trying to streamline those. And we've since sort of taken on a larger spectrum of this whole sort of continuum of pain that exists in the design and construction industry and try to leverage technology to really gain efficiencies. So that's really been a lot of the project that we've been doing in the past two years is really how do you leverage technology to scale um, prefabrication. Um, so your second question or the question. Uh, talk about uh, some of the innovative procedures that you, go, you would introduce the public school. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when we came into the industry, I think, California still has about 100,000 portables, um, many of them well past their useful life. So that was a pretty easy bird in hand problem to try to solve. Um, and we all know that these are not in great environments for kids to learn in on day one, much less after a portable's been there for 10, 15 years. So that was our first problem to tackle and we asked the very simple question is, isn't there a better way to do this? Why is this the only solution for growth? Um, and it seems to proliferate, not just in California, but you know, nationally. Um, and so to tackle that, we didn't want to just sort of present a better portable solution, but really think about how can we play a part in revolutionizing the whole construction industry by um, off-siting some pieces of the puzzle and really understanding from each of the stakeholders, architects, general contractors, owners, what are the problems you're facing uh, and why don't we have a better solution? Um, and so we really set out to build just better buildings, permanent buildings, um, but we also knew that uh, in public construction and certainly schools, time is of the essence, right? You have summer build windows or maybe a little longer, but you have kids in adjacent sites that need to be learning at the same time. So how can we have a light on the land fast approach, um, but still have the quality um, of traditional construction? So a lot of folks, I think someone brought up the sort of triangle of quality cost and, um, and you can't have all three. We wanted to have all three and we didn't see why we couldn't have all three. Um, and so one of the ways that we as a company has tackled this is just asking the question, but also we're a investor. We have investors who are very, very invested in us figuring out this problem and um, adding value to the entire construction industry and scaling it rapidly, right? Which sometimes can be very frustrating because these are all technology investors wanting to play a space in, in the construction industry, which is a very different industry. But nonetheless, that work is important. And I think one of the problems in the construction and design industry is the siloing, right? We're still looking at a very craft craft industry, we haven't hard, had our industrial revolution yet. Uh, and so part of that is this sort of movement towards industrialized construction. Um, and there's many solutions out there and there's many great companies doing work in that space. But I think at that, that um, the real sort of catalyst for it has to be technology because you can't scale um, by just using a sort of old school craft approach. Right, and it's interesting that uh, I was talking earlier about one of the biggest challenges we face at least in our region, is the labor market is just not there. And so being able to control that uh, labor market by taking some of the work offsite and controlling that environment a little bit, I know uh, has benefited us uh, greatly in our district. So, you know, we've talked about the planning component and we've talked about uh, some of the scheduling and innovation and creativity. And one of the things we look at as, at as a district is, um, you know, we, uh, for example, just for me, and there's gonna be a lot of, and Grace will talk about this more in depth, but. Um, we do our bond cycles on odd years. So I'll have, uh, we'll sell 130, 140 million on 19, 21, 23. And as those years progress, guess what else progresses? Is escalation at 4% per year. And so uh, early on, I started to think, okay, how can I beat this escalation? What could I do? My AV will not allow me to sell. Uh, you know, my CFO will say, oh, you're bumping your bonding capacity, slow down. But I'm telling them, hey, escalation's going crazy. I gotta beat this somehow. Let's, let's talk about uh, solutions. And I started digging into uh, the P3 
discussions, public-private market uh, partnerships, and had some real interesting discussions. So, Grace, I'm going to go to you now, and I will have you introduce yourself. And then, the question uh, that I would want to ask you is, how do public-private partnerships differ from traditional project delivery when developing the educational infrastructure? Sure. Thanks, uh, Grace Hartman. I work. Um, I'm part of Aon, so for those of you who don't know, Aon Aon is a large risk consultancy and insurance brokerage uh, throughout the world. Um, I am part of a group within Aon called Aon Infrastructure Solutions. We are kind of the center of excellence for alternative project delivery slash public-private partnerships, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, in terms of how, you know, how is P3 different from, from traditional project delivery? I think the first you have to just make sure that we're all kind of on the same playing field as to what a public-private partnership is. You know, depending on your industry and depending on context, the P3 can mean something very different depending on, depending on your audience. When we're talking about P3s, we're really, I mean, when you boil it down, it's really talking about um, infrastructure that, uh, that has public use, whether that be a, be a road, bridge, tunnel, or, you know, a courthouse, and in this case, uh, an, ed an educational facility um, that has some form of private capital. And in most cases, there's a long-term operations and maintenance where that private entity comes in and not only builds, but also operates and maintains a project over, say, 30 years. So the way that it's different from traditional project delivery, um, I've heard a lot of, you know, you guys have, have all been, I've, I've been listening to you guys all day today. It's, you know, traditional project delivery. You're a school district. You think, okay, I, you know, you've made the decision through your planning process. I need to build a school. Uh, so I'm going to enter into an agreement with an architect. Um, they're going to give us the design. I'm going to take that design and I'm going to let it uh, out in the market for, uh, to, you know, to get the lowest construction price. Once that, and then you also go through the process of raising, raising funds through your bonding mechanism. Once that project is complete, then uh, you as a school district take over the operations and maintenance of that project. When you're talking about public-private partnerships, instead of you as the school district entering into all these different agreements with you know, all these different stakeholders, you're entering into one agreement with one private entity who's responsible for designing, building, financing, and then operating and maintaining that project over the long term. So we call it the DBFOM. Um, and by doing that, um, you know, it, I think one, it helps to align the interests of the stakeholders uh, because you have, you know, one private entity who's, who is going to make sure that the design is considering the long term efficiencies and the operations and maintenance. So, you know, making sure that, you know, the design adds in, you know, includes, um, you know, LED lighting, um, you know, with that, that may cost more during construction, but it's going to lead to a lot of efficiencies over the long term. Um, so you have that align alignment of interests by having, a, you know, a partner who is there to, to um, who, who's essentially in a marriage with you over the next 30 years. Um, I think also um, uh, by working through this, you know, I think, it's, it's helpful because you've got, uh, sorry, I just have my notes here. Um, <clears throat> oh, they've, well, more, more, most importantly, you know, they, they also are, are responsible for, for financing that. But I, I think one thing that, that's very, that, that sometimes get, gets lost in, in the weeds is just because you have a private entity who's financing the project does not mean that the project is free for you. Um, you know, it's really instead, you know, they, they're responsible for financing, but over the long term, um, they expect to get their return on investment back. Um, so typically the way that that's done is through an availability style mechanism. Uh, so you build, you design, build, operate, and maintain this project. And then once the project is complete and you get into that operations and maintenance phase, that private entity is incentivized to operate to the highest standards, to make sure that the lights are on, to make sure that the, that the air conditioning is running. Because if they don't, then you as the public entity who is paying them to operate and maintain that project over the long term, you're not going to pay them as, mu pay them as much, and they may not be able to service their debt, and they may not be able to get their internal rate of return that they're expecting. Um, so there's a lot of pieces that go that go into this, but you know I think that you know it's when it comes to P3s, by no means do we feel that um, public-private partnerships are the be-all and end-all to to fixing everybody's infrastructure problems. But what I hope to do is to is to allow you to recognize that it's a tool in the toolbox that that can be used, you know, when it's when it makes sense. Thank you, and you know the the important thing on 
uh, P3, especially in public schools, is we don't have a trophy on the wall yet that we can point to and say, this is how we did it. We're talking real-time discussions. We're, you know, how are, how are we going to get there um, in, to, to the point where we're, it's automatic? We know, how to get to, we know how to access the money, who are the sources, and that sort of thing. And so we're inviting the discussions now. And so when we talk about this, when we're talking about maybe some managing risks, Amber, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch over to you now. Talk to us about uh, managing risk um, in your school district. Thank you, Brett. So risks um, basically um, available for every project and exist, and there's no public project without risk or zero risk. Uh, the way to manage them is to allocate them, and that's the best management of risk, by allocating it to the best party who can handle it. Risk management, uh, especially with public entities, starts with, and the, with the most complex type of risks that we go through as facilities people, and I will identify some of those. Number one, the politics and making sure that your vision aligning with the vision of the superintendent and the board of the school district, the executive staff, because if the vision do not align, you will have a hard, hard time getting things done. So make sure that the vision is aligned. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, I moved to m my uh, new district back in no last November, Moria Valley Unified School District last November, and they were about to basically start bidding a high school, a new high school project. So everyone is happy and excited. The community is excited. It's, it's very, uh, it's a showcase project for everyone and it's very important, very critical. But when I started doing the math, basically we don't have the enrollment that we can get state funding for. We don't have the ability to uh, get state funding. So I went to my boss and we went to the superintendent and the board and we explained to them that, hey, this is not going to be feasible. So we had to work hard with the, with the executive uh, staff to make sure that we can switch from the, a high school idea, we can basically modify it into putting that whole project on hold and utilize that money wisely to do something else, which is a getting 18 mo sites modernized and we can apply for state funding and we can't get it. So we held town hall meetings and things like that. So it's a it's legwork you have to do. It's very important. The other risk is basically the uh, uh, the escalation that we heard about it. And, and, and this is what you need to uh, do to build some contingencies and build some uh, plan, some plans for your um, des designers to compete with uh, the market conditions, basically, and uh, put some cushion, some room. Um, also, the delivery method you choose, it's very important. Uh, and the risk, the final one that I will, uh, you know, I have 130 risks identified. If you guys are interested, I could email it to you. Um, the other one, but we have two minutes for each question, so I have to comply with the time. The other thing is the technology. I was with Well uh, at lunch, and we were talking about technology, and he asked me, hey, are we moving from one to one or Chromebooks and, and, and uh, iPods to touch screen now? I said, yeah, we are, basically. It's, it's crazy. Technology becoming very crazy, and some of the technology systems are closed circuit systems. And you have to design it ahead of time. You have to get approval ahead of time. It's no more design thing. It has to be get approved in advance and, and basically identified in whatever the district wants to make sure that the designer know the district's vision and s specifications and standards. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's an important distinction that I pr probably should have made when we're talking about managing risk. You know, uh, there's one. it's one thing to make sure that uh, you have proper ADA accessibility all over campus. But when you're talking about program-wide, you're talking about risk at a completely different level. And you mentioned things like cost escalation and, and contingencies and those things and trying to manage risk. So, so we've talked about that a little bit. We've talked about how we can build efficiencies in, how, can we how we can do alternative deliveries. And so framing that uh, topic, Brian, I'm gonna go to you and talk, talk to us a little bit about uh, how you've developed creative s solutions. You've heard about these different challenges we face. Talk about some creative solutions you've you worked with. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to share with you uh, an example, which I think is a, a wonderful example of success here in California and hopefully something that, that you can share with, with your own districts and your own 
locales. But, you know, just for a moment, when we talk about risk, um, you know, the districts we work with are extremely risk adverse, right? And it makes sense. It's not your money. When's the last time someone gave you $100 million and said, here, go spend this? But by the way, don't screw up, <laughs> right? I mean, it's a lot of pressure. And, and the same exists for districts. And, and so it's very hard for us sometimes to try and really push our districts, our partners, our clients to consider um, risk and managing risk um, within what, what is their comfort zone. But I want to share with you an example. In 2014, we engaged a small school district in Daly City, California, called Bayshore Elementary School District. Daly City is in South San Francisco, just, just south of San Francisco on the peninsula, uh, right off the bay. Beautiful little district, very small district. Um, the property values are extremely high, um, but because the district was so small, uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't go out for a large bond. In fact, um, the bond that they passed in 2014 was for $6 million. And um, they had two schools, intermediate school and elementary school. They were a K-8 school district. Um, and one of the things they wanted to do, of course, was transform their learning environments. And when we looked at it initially, we said, um, you know, we did a needs assessment. And I often tell our clients, you know, when we go put together a master plan or needs assessment, it's probably going to be four or five times what your bonding capacity is, what your actual needs are. When we add in all the contingencies and we add in all the escalation and all the indirect and soft costs, as we often call them, and, and that was no different. I mean, they, they had two campuses, 1950s, both in, in woeful uh, condition. I mean, hazardous materials, seismic issues. You know, in the state of California, we have the Field Act, which came around in the 1930s as a result of some major earthquakes in Southern California. And we have to go through the Department of the State Architect, which means we have to build those buildings to a higher level uh, seismically than anything else in the state. In fact, I often joke with my neighbors and friends, if you ever have a severe uh, earthquake or natural disaster of some kind, find your way to the nearest public school because it will be still standing. And, and, and that is absolutely the case. I mean, the, the extreme that we have to go to seismically, also in California, we're one of the most stringent when it comes to access compliance and Americans with Disabilities Act and a lot of these things. This is what's driving the cost of, of public schools through the roof. But we approached him and we said, you know, like most architects, you'd look at it, you'd say three million to one school, three million to one school, and you'd see no measurable difference. You'd see improvements in code health and safety, but there'd be no measurable improvement to the learning environment itself. It'd be fundamentally the same. And so we start to look at it and say, you know, you have these two schools that are so geographically close to one another. What if we combine them onto one campus? We went multi-story, developed the K-8, which we all know there's a lot of research that says that a K-8 versus the transition from an elementary school to a middle school environment is sometimes more valuable to, to students in the process of, of transition. And, and we said, what if we surplus sold one of your sites? How much could we generate uh, for the sale of, of that land? And initially, we, we figured it might be 13 to $14 million uh, to sell seven acres, which is tremendous. I mean, there are not a lot of places in California where we can sell a site that's six or seven or eight acres for 13, $14 million, but it still wasn't enough money. Because if we took the six million we had plus the 13 or 14, we needed something more like $30 million to build them a brand new 21st century all-inclusive school. So we took it one step further. We said, tell you what, you spend a little bit more money and we'll go out and we'll actually entitle it, we'll rezone it for residential units. And we'll take it to the marketplace rezoned with all of those units developed, um, put together just like a developer would. And so we led that process as architects. We, we hired the civil engineer, landscape architect. We convinced the superintendent who was uh, amazing. I mean, one of these uh, young lady, um, that had just a tremendous risk, risk tolerance uh, to take that on and a, and a board of trustees that was very well aligned. Um, and so we took it entirely through um, uh, planning commission, city council, uh, got it rezoned, 71 home units on seven acres, obviously a very dense development. Um, and we put it out to the marketplace and we sold that land for $24.5 million. Um, pretty remarkable story. Now the interesting thing was when we went through the process of design, um, and we came to the point, we, we had a contractor on board early on. We talked about multiple delivery methods. In California, we have what we call lease lease back, which allows us to actually select a contractor early in the process under qualifications-based selection process, not lowest responsible bid. So we brought them in, and they did a lot of estimating. But, you know, because of the escalation we were facing in the Bay Area, you know, we're fighting against contractors that are building Apple and building Google and building, you know, these tremendous facilities. And uh, we went out to the marketplace. We bid the subtrades. It was $5 million over budget for a $30 million school. And we thought we were done. We thought, that's it, finished. We're gonna pack up, 
you know, and, and we had spent, you know, by that time, several million dollars in indirect costs to get them to this point. And superintendent, in a moment of greatness, she said, don't worry, we'll go out for another bond. Oh, but by the way, we're going to tear down the old school first and relocate those kids to interim housing and portables on the other campus, and we're going to go out to those voters, and we're going to say, you have to support us because we don't have any other choice. And she did, and that bond passed 83%. It was the highest capita bond that year. It's pretty amazing, because when you put the voters in a p position where it's like, okay, we're not going to leave our kids in portables and other facilities for the indefinite future, um, they stepped up to the plate. And um, it's a beautiful facility. got finished uh, just last year. We had 14 months to build it, $30 million, um, and, the, and the kids went in in September. And the community loves it. I mean, it's, it's a beacon for the community. But that is a unique story. That does not happen all the time, as you probably well know. But when you talk about ways to find money and think outside the box, sometimes we have to think about how can we generate more money. And oftentimes, school districts are land rich, but you know, bond poor. And there's a way sometimes we have to figure out how to do that. In this particular case, we were successful in figuring that out. Well, that one, uh, that one feels a bit like extortion, Brian, but, you know, whatever works. It, it was absolutely extortion, and, and I will tell you, that was not our recommendation, but she took it. <laughs> but if it works, you know, extortion. Hey, we're talking about risk, and so I, I want to stick with that theme. Uh, Mariah, as I go to you, uh, just we've talked about managing our risk, and I'll talk to you about an actual conversation that I've had uh, many times, really, but... You know, uh, we're an open enrollment district. Some of you that face that same challenge, uh, you know, kids like the school one year and they like another school next year. And so that enrollment surge, as it happens throughout your district, is a nightmare for facilities. And so actual conversations that I'm sure some of you facilities guys or gals have had is that November I get a call from central enrollment, maybe December, I need two more at Greer or three more classrooms at Greer, or four more classrooms at Derrick Kelly. Great. When do you need them by? August, right? How many of you had those conversations? And, and then in California, we have this thing called DSA, uh, Department of State Architect, and it's just black hole where your plans go for 12 months while they figure out if it's the right thing to do. And uh, anyway, so we get those calls, and we got to put classrooms in quickly, and so I'm having conversations with the likes of Brian and other architects Hey, no Frank Lloyd Wright awards here. I need efficient, right? I need effective. I need good space quickly that looks good and is functional, functional and efficient. So those conversations I've had, and I've actually turned to Mark and say, talk to me about components <laughs> construction. What are its advantages? Um, why should I do this? And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that question with you. Well, Brett, it's good that first off, you did know that I existed. So, I mean, I think part of the, the biggest risk is our own ignorance and our own sort of stubborn kind of adhering to the status quo and not looking for other solutions, right? Yeah, and you know, uh, I, I just want to add because one of the things we've all done is, and what I hate, and I hope there's no manufacturers in the room at this point, but I hate it when buildings show up on the backs of trucks. That bothers me because I taught too and, and I feel like I'm teaching from a box. So I was looking for the solution, the slab on grade solution type of thing. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but go ahead and continue on. Well, I mean, I think the biggest, you know, you're up against time, right? And time uh, is a risk factor that you need to handle. It both works against you and it works for you, right? Because by building urgency into something, oftentimes it can kind of get us doing stuff about it. Um, but one of the things at Project Prague is like looking at the continuum, figuring out, given that in California we have this onerous process with the Division of State Architect, is, okay, well, how can we sort of try to game that system and figure out what, what they're looking for and how to get things that are, will go through that system much quicker. So Brett knew that we had a lot of tools in place to get through that system, um, something called a pre-check as well, um, to help uh, accelerate the design uh, as well but also knew that we work best when we work with partners and collaborators. And so that was an important aspect of it as well. Um, not that we can't work with a new team, but you're gonna get the best value out of folks who are kind of by, by nature collaborating. Um, but I think when it came to the build period, right, we had what, no more than two and a half months for the whole thing, right? Right, um, and so that you don't, you know, as an owner, you don't want to just go by some cool new company that you think can do it. You have to know that it's actually possible. So from us, we need to be vetted by our entire kind of 
stakeholder community, the general contractors, the architects, and so a lot of the work we do is de-risking before Brett gets to us and building relationships with architects, building relationships with general contractors to make sure that they know how our system works and what the value of it is. It's not just bringing it to site and you know they can walk away. Um, I think the value of a componentized system is that the general contractors understand we, we use all the trades. Um, we're not kind of building everything on site. Some things are just done best on site. Um, you get more tolerances on site, you can do fixes on site. So from that perspective, we wanted to really have a hybrid solution, but the time was the factor. Um, so really figuring out how to get the sort of most expensive trades off site or at least off the site quicker. Um, so what we really are is a core and shell solution and allowed you to get sort of uh, the high impact stuff done very quickly. I think we were roughed in in less than a month. And then it was the other trades that came in. And from the perspective of an operating school, you don't want a lot of trucks coming to site, et cetera. So we utilize the just-in-time delivery method where our materials came just at the day that they were supposed to be erected so that there weren't a lot of materials uh, left around on site because there's risk related to that as well. Um, from a just pure construction standpoint, for instance, some of the things that we decided to integrate into our kit had to do with the most high-risk components, for instance, roofing. So for every, in California, for every dollar of wages a roofer makes, you also have to add 75 cents on that dollar for the insurance related to roofing, right? So if you can figure out a way to facilitate and make that process go on faster and quicker, um, you're reducing the risk right there. And so, so with other of the trades as well, a lot of the trades that are kind of on top of each other or we're messing with the sort of sequence of their delivery. So a lot of it is working with, okay, asking our partners, what are the pain points? Because we went into the market with a full solution and we've since de-scoped because we realized we were getting in their way rather than solving their problem. So a lot of it is just asking the questions. We'd love to think that we were the best solution of all time, but the reality is, is we're gonna have to shape shift and learn from our mistakes and, and uh, try to integrate that into the next practice. So that's another thing is just admitting when things aren't working out so well. Uh, and we had a lot of um, meetings after our project, uh, your project, to really look at what worked, what didn't work. And, and that's, I think, a really critical piece of the process that most people, people loathe because it just, you know, they think it's gonna be a finger pointing session, but from our standpoint, it's, we're really excited by it because we can learn a lot because the next iteration, we can integrate that into our kit. So those are all the ways that we're sort of trying to bring you value, um, but also uh, from our standpoint as business people, we need to reduce the amount of churn that's happening internally, right? We have architects, structural engineers, all of that within our own shop, but we're not a services company, we're a product company. So we don't wanna spend a lot of our time doing what you should be doing, right? And what you're best at doing. Um, so really trying to figure out how we can also minimize our own churn internally and collaborate on that level as well. Great, thank you. So, Grace, I'm going to go back to you. Um, you know, you've heard a lot about our challenges. And again, these are real-time conversations when it comes to the alternative types of delivery methods when we're talking about P3 and K12. But in hearing these conversations, and just uh, in not just these conversations, but the ones you've had before, what, tell us what pitfalls uh, do you see or what opportunities can you talk about for P3 in public schools? Thanks. Um, well, I want to start, you know, I've, I've heard a lot, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but the theme is there's not a lot of funding, and how do we, how do we pay for that? I will say one thing that's very interesting about public-private partnerships, um, you guys, you know, the, you guys may not have funding. The amount of capital, private capital, that has nowhere to go right now is astounding. I mean, there is so much private capital that wants to invest in infrastructure, Granted, this is, you know, this is civil infrastructure, but it also includes so social infrastructure. Just to give you uh, just a, an order of magnitude, um, LaGuardia Airport, um, they are doing a terminal redevelopment um, as a public-private partnership, and there were some private bonds, private uh, but tax-exempt bonds that uh, went out to markets, um, and uh, it was a billion-dollar bond issue, and it was 10 times oversubscribed. So there were 10 billion, there was $10 billion that was available that wanted to go into one project. Um, so, you know, I think that there's, there's, there's just a lot of capital out there and there aren't enough projects. Um, and, you know, the, the, you know, I think one of the pitfalls, especially when talking about uh, K through 12, is 
The, the public-private partnerships that we have seen to date in the U.S. have been those mega projects. Um, they, they're large projects, you know, 500 million all the way up to, you know, two billion dollars. Um, so, you know, you guys are on, a, it's on a different scale and I think we all understand that. The reason why we tend to see those mega projects right now is because they're, um, there's a lot of due diligence that goes into this. You know, there's a lot of contract negotiation, lots and lots of lawyers uh, that need to be paid, um, lots of public um, constituents that need to sort of be educated and understand how this process works. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, there's a long lead time and it's, and it, you know, it leads to kind of needing those larger projects in order to really achieve the economies of scale. But we, what we have seen is, you know, along with those large projects and where I think that there could be some potential opportunities uh, within, your, within your space is the bundling of smaller projects. Um, there was a, on the civil side, uh, Pennsylvania bridges is, you know, there are lots of deficient bridges in, throughout the state of Pennsylvania, and I think it was 668 really small bridges. Instead of letting, um, you know, letting 668 uh, tiny little projects uh, to, to, to fix all of those bridges. Uh, Pencil the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation put everything together and they bundled it together to achieve those efficiencies of scale, excuse me, economies of scale. So, you know, if you, if you are in a large school district and you do have, you know, a, a significant amount of capital uh, in your capital plan that you think could potentially benefit from, uh, from bundling and, and taking advantage of the vast, I mean, just the, the sickening amount of private capital that is available for, for infrastructure right now, I, you know, I think it's, it's something to, to look into. Um, I think, you know, another pitfall that I see, and, um, uh, you know, Samar had, had mentioned it earlier, is um, political risk. Um, so he, you know, you, got, you were talking about, uh, about the boards. You know, we, when you, if you go to a, a public-private partnership conference, they all talk about how, you know, in, in, the, in the, the country, you know, you're dealing with 50 different governments. Um, but when you're talking at the, at the you, know, at, at, you know, educational level, you're talking about municipalities, you're, you're talking about school boards. I mean, you're talking thousands and thousands of, of different constituents and, or excuse me, uh, decision makers who want to have a say. Um, and so what you don't want is to go through the entire process only to have to need, you know, a unanimous school board vote after you spend millions of dollars on a procurement um, and then, you know, one person holds out and the whole thing goes down the drain. So, you know, I think that is something that you, that you need to work through. My, just a little selling point, uh, my group, we have a model uh, that's called the P3 Pursuits Risks and Opportunities Index, P3 Pro, that essentially rates, it, it grades the friendliness and the readiness of, uh, at, at you know, the model level, it's at the state level of your ability to pursue P3s, but we have the ability to take the information that we learn and apply it to a municipality to see whether, you know, it actually, you know, whether you could actually be successful in your pursuit of a P3 in that, in, in that municipality. Great. When you said there's... I can't remember what you said in terms of billions of dollars of capital out there. I, my first thought was, boy, I hope you brought a lot of business cards because everybody's <laughs> going to want to know where that money's at. But um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to go one last question and then because I want to leave a little bit of time at the end for questions. So, Brian, I'm going to go to you. Uh, and This will be the last question of the panel before we it's let the audience. unscripted here, Brad. I know. I know. <laughs> uh, so tell us what you think is the key to future success for public school design. Well, it, you know, I know we heard a lot t today about doing more with less, but I don't actually think that exists. I think you either do more with more or you do less with less. <laughs> and I just want to focus for a moment on more with more. And, you know, I think what you could see here is kind of a, a consistency of what we're talking about. Um, you know, the knee-jerk reaction, I think, for a lot of you when we're, when we're dealing with a program where we don't have enough funding is to say, what can we descope? What can we pull out? What can we push off to a later phase? What can we remove? How can we pinch you know, the contracting community, the architects and engineers, or all of the indirect costs to try to save more money for, for the direct or the hard costs? And certainly there's, there's strategies and, and, and ways to do that. But fundamentally, you know, what, what we look at as a creative organization is, you know, and I covet design. Believe me, I love design. But I love problem solving. And I really love to solve a problem where we say to our clients, don't think about the budget. Think about what the blue sky is. What can you imagine? What's your vision for this school facility in the future? And we'll figure out a way to make it happen. We'll figure out, can we use 
componentized construction or, or, or modular type construction to, to save construction costs and get to market sooner? Can we leverage private financing um, to get again to market sooner so that if we can, if we can pay less than you know, the four to five percent in terms of, of, of the increase in, in escalation in terms of financing, then it's a win-win. Can we leverage assets that a district may have either in surplus sale or other sort of ways um, to try to generate more, more funds? Can we, can we uh, push a little bit harder on our bond consultants to, to leverage more bond capacity and, and really challenge the voters? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, it's all about how we market it. It's all about how we push it out there to the community. Um, the community wants you to win. They want to be supportive. They want to be helpful. And, and everybody involved really wants to, to float all boats at once. And so for us, it's really focusing on you know, not what limits us, but where are the opportunities and what can we find out there to really challenge ourselves to bring more money to the table and ultimately build the dreams that we have for our students and our teachers. Great, thanks. So we have uh, four minutes for questions or you can get to the bar early, it's up to you. Yeah. We're uh, all in the way in the back. Thank you. So my question to Brian is really new. Is that all right? Sure. Um, uh, the challenges you have is that you want to come in and you want people to dream about spaces. Expectations and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so give us tips from an architect's perspective on how we can help you manage the attention so we keep our eyes on budget as you're going through and saying dream. Yeah. It, it's really all about communication. And and the first thing that we often do with our clients is we go through a, a visionary meeting. You know, I, I love the image that, that Barry had up with all of the people in the room there kind of talking. I can imagine them all sort of blue skying about what is it that we dream about. And at some point, you know, we're collecting that data. We're sort of, you know, looking at and talking to all of the individuals in the room. And really what we're asking the question is, what is it that's most compelling? Because ultimately we're going to have to prioritize. We're going to have to pick what projects we think are, are the most important to that community, to that district, to that school, to that facility. And there are going to be other things that ultimately maybe have to go by the wayside. And, you know, I'll give you a good example. We had a small district um, up, in, up in the foothills. You know, they're big on athletics. And, you know, while I think all of us have talked about the idea of creating new classroom spaces, the big thing for them that we learned was if we can just remodel that stadium, Everybody's going to support us for many, many years in the future. And so what we're trying to do is create a program for them that the stadium becomes the highest priority and there's still some funding available for the educational aspect of it. Now, you might say that's short-sighted. You might say, you know, that community. Um, but for that community and their culture, that's hugely important. And, you know, one of the things that came up the other day uh, or excuse me, even today in, in the conversations was, was what does the future hold? And I can't tell you what the future holds sometimes. I mean, none of us really have a crystal ball. But the implications of online learning and what that means for, for uh, districts in the future, oftentimes we will tell them, you know, yes, we want to make investments in the classrooms. Classrooms may not exist in 30 or 40 or 50 years, and we're making decisions on facilities that have to last longer than that. So oftentimes we're making decisions on facilities that we know um, are really going to support both the, the collaboration, the socialization in schools, you know, the multi-purpose types of facilities, some of the athletic facilities, even the administrations that support these facilities because the classrooms ultimately might change. And so we'll make nominal investments even in furniture and technology, but even further reaching investments in um, the spaces that we know will be compelling in the future. Brett, can I piggyback on that just sure. quickly too? I would, I would advise too to have that discussion when you're communicating. Have it not be about space, but have about 
blue skying about the activities that they want, the things that they want that aren't necessarily about space, because that's where you get into a pickle, is when people start adhering around a physical idea of what they want. What you're really trying to get at and what gives you more flexibility is to start talking about what they really want to accomplish uh, rather than the types of spaces, because you're asking oftentimes laymen to talk about space in ways that they just can't articulate. Do we have time for more questions? Or? If we have time for one more question. Is there another question? Right here. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it, it, it's new. It's a new concept. Uh, we do see P3s more for higher ed. Um, and it's, I mean, I think that it's, it's, a, it's about what you, what you want them to operate. Uh, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to take over everything. You know, you may have Aramark, you know, that, you know, they, they do private, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the food facilities. But when it comes to P3s, you know, I'll, I'll just give an example, UC Merced. Um, is was a was a public private partnership that I think reached financial close in 2017, um, but it's essentially um, to it's a it was a whole a build out of an entire campus, um, and they wanted to do it through a through a P3 because one it helped to um, it, it uh, sped up the process um, and helped to make sure that they were looking at you know a, a truly integrated design and and facility. But that doesn't you know in terms of what they're what they're ultimately operating you know it's operating the lights and the fixtures. And, um, you know, I think that you, you have some flexibility as to what exactly you want that to look like. Um, and it's just a matter of setting the scope um, so that, so that it's, it's, it truly works with, with what works for, for you as a, as a district. Are there any of these institutions that you um, In terms of the traditional design, build, finance, operate, and maintain, no. Um, so it's a, it's a new concept, as I said, and, you know, one of the things that I'd say, you know, along with the fact that there's private capital who, you know, they're, they're looking for, for places for their money to go, there are also a lot of um, private entities, whether that be contractors um, or, or um, private equity that's, you know, they're, they're really looking to, to come up with new opportunities. Um, and so in that case, you know, what we see is a lot of those entities who want to provide, you know, go to a public owner with an unsolicited bid and say, here's our idea. You know, we know that you, you know, that you, we've looked at your capital plan. We know that you are, you know, you are having issues here. So here is, you know, we're going to put forth an unsolicited bid. What do you think about it? And then, you know, I think it's, it's a matter for you as a public owner just to be open to that and to be open to new ideas um, to, to, to kind of start that process. But it's, I mean, you know, P3s in the U.S. are, it's, it's still kind of, you know, I've, I feel like they've been saying for 10 years, everyone's just, you know, next year is the year that it's going to take off. Um, in Canada, they're very, very, um, they're, we see them all over the place. I, there might be some K through 12 up in Canada. I think there, there, I think there are, and they're, they're bundled schools. Um, but, you know, it's still kind of new here. That's why, you know, I think everyone in the industry were, we're all advocates for the industry and we all want to, you know, go out and educate and help, you know, everyone sort of understand this new process um, so that, you know, when it does come across your desk, you, you at least know what it is and, and, and then we can, we can kind of help you, uh, you know, walk the path as you, as you go down it. I was speaking to a gentleman from Calgary last night, yeah, and he has implemented this model mm -hmm. in the Calgary school system. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, guys.